Hello and welcome again to the official EFL podcast and what an episode we have to end the season on. Of course, it's a Skybet Championship playoff final special. We'll be speaking to legends from both Brentford and Fulham, hearing how it wasn't all plain sailing for Brentford star Ollie Watkins and our resident EFL expert Joby McEnough will be here to preview all the action. But first, here's a reminder of how both teams put their place at Wembley. And tries to get Brentford on the attack, yes. Great ball for Watkins, who's through here, it's only Watkins! Game on at Griffin Park! It didn't take them long! Brentford were searching for a quick start, and they got one, courtesy of their main man, Oli Watkins! And Rob spotted something, it's a good header, oh, it's a great header! Emiliano Marcondes, barely 15 minutes gone, and Brentford have turned the tie on its head! Here is Jensen, away from Gallagher, Henry providing the outlet, delivering first time, what a great ball in, and what a finish from Brian and Bermo! Oh, they're in the driving seat now, all right! Brentford raised the score to three, and they lead overall by three goals to one. Wembley is well within their sights now, what a start to the second half! Ayu feeds one forward, and Janssen makes a mess of it, Brewster! Swansea back in it! They have hope again, and Rian Brewster might just have given Swansea a chance. It is goodbye, Griffin Park. It's hello, Wembley, for Brentford. Joe Wills will take this. And it's headed in! Cardiff City do have the early goal. Here's Curtis Nelson has put the ball in the back of the net. And that is the ideal start for Neil Harris's side. They are back in this time. Fulham are behind. It's 2-1 to Fulham on aggregate. And it's game on. And Bobby Reed puts it into the box and they've scored immediately. Naiskins Cabano has scored practically from the kickoff. That's extraordinary. It's 1-1, two goals in less than 60 seconds, and it's Cabano again. In goes that throw in. Long and looping, and only half-headed away, great save, and in! Lee Tomlin has scored for Cardiff City right at the start of the second half. 90 seconds less than that into the second half. The substitution has paid off immediately. His selection problems can wait for another day and he'll have a few going into a final at Wembley. But when Paul Tierney blows his whistle next, I'm pretty sure that will mean Fulham are at Wembley. Well, a wonderful playoff semi-final yet again. Fulham have done it on August the 4th under the Wembley Arch. Two West London neighbours will go head to head. Well, it's now time to, to go down under as we speak to a Brentford Hall of Famer. That man is, of course, legendary former striker Lloyd Owusu. First of all, Lloyd, how are you feeling after Brentford secured their place at Wembley? Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I woke up this morning to a, a heave of messages on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, saying that they, they had done it. And then obviously I looked straight onto the BBC website and then I saw the, the result and I was absolutely buzzing for the boys in the club. Yeah, four a.m. I think it was. So you can be forgiven for uh, for missing the the game as you got up. But uh, we'll get more into talking about uh, the current team in a moment. But first, explain to us what the club itself means to you. You played, you know, for for many teams, of course, in your career. But you describe Brentford as your club. Yeah, Brentford's my family club, man. That's that's my that's my home. I always call it my home. You know, from the first day I signed to the last day I left on my second spell. Uh, the Brentford fans especially made it real special for me. Uh, no matter rain or shine, they were there for us as players collectively. Uh, they really got behind us no matter if you were playing well or if you weren't playing well. But it's the thing with Brentford fans, when they saw a player who put their hand on their heart and, and worked tirelessly in, in games, they loved that. And uh, I appreciate everything that Brentford fans, especially and obviously the club as a whole, did for me. Yeah, just, just looking at your career a bit more closely, you joined from non-league, um, you joined Brentford from Slough, I believe it was. Um, you were an instant hit, scoring 25 goals in your first year. What do you put that individual success down to? Uh, a few factors, to be fair. Uh, 
I was always one of the guys who wanted to do that extra bit more because I, because I hadn't had that real nurture of uh, YTS football growing up where you train, train day in and day out. I came from that non-league way, so I was only training two nights a week. So I knew for me to get to the next level with the rest of the boys in this team and even in the league, should I say, I had to be that bit better. So for me, it was all about doing extra. So even when I did turn pro, I was still doing extra training with my mentor at the time, Danny Bailey. Uh, I, would, I would go up to Walthamstow every Sunday after a game and just train extra with him. We'd do bike rides, swimming, hill runs, everything. And obviously football stuff as well. And that made me, and I believe all that did make me a good player and make me score the 25 goals at the end of the season uh, in my first year, which was word of over stuff. Yeah, is it about proving people wrong a little bit when you are coming from non-league? Obviously, you know some people may underestimate you not having that that background of you know coming through an academy in, in the EFL or the Premier League. Correct, of course, because obviously at the end of the day, non-league people deem it as, uh, especially in my days, just what, what kind of league is it? Just non-league football. They just play a couple, they train a couple of nights a week, where all these other professionals are training every day, week in and week out. But the great thing about the non-league, and I've and I've seen over the years, is that these, there are hungry guys who want to really be successful and have, have a piece of that pie like the rest of the professional guys in the world. So for me, my aim was just to obviously hopefully get the opportunity, which I did in the end. And with that opportunity, I had to take it and prove people that I belong here. And I feel believe I, I, I think I did a bit more than believing in my own ability. And I think a lot of people were like, wow, this guy has got a bit something special. And uh, I had a great year. Yeah, you certainly did. As I mentioned, you were inducted into that Brentford Hall of Fame not long ago as well. Just tell us, what does that mean to you personally, to be part of the history of that football club? Yeah, again, a massive honour. Uh, when I found out about it, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I was actually due to come back. I was coming back to England the year that they gave it to me, and they, they got wind that I was coming back. And Peter Gillam, legend, may, uh, may I say, uh, called me up and said, Lloyd, we believe that you're coming back and you've been inducted in the Hall of Fame. And I was just like, serious? He goes, yeah, for sure. He says, uh, we've got a live game against uh, Nottingham Forest and we would love to do it on the pitch in front of all the home fans. And I just thought it was a blessing. It was just a true, a, a dream come true to be able to come back after many years to be recognised as a, a player who has done a lot for the club and helped the club and taken the club to a certain level. And just for them to put me in the Hall of Fame, I was just truly, truly blessed and humbled. You mentioned the club being at a certain level. Just how impressed have you been, though, since you left the club? Um, how much it's a- achieved since then? And, and obviously, you know, one game away from the Premier League now. Yeah, I mean, I was actually, luckily for myself, I was actually back in January uh, before I had to travel to, to Ghana. So I went to the training ground and uh, I met up with Thomas Franks and obviously my old captain, Kev O'Connor, invited me back to the training ground. Every time I come back, they always let me come and just hang out there. And I went in, had a session with the boys. And like I said, like you say, football's evolved so much. Uh, the training ground, obviously, it's still the same training ground that I was at when I, my last year there with the little portal cabins. But this time, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's evolved a bit regards a bit more, bit, a few more portal cabins and the, t- the video analysis rooms, the, the physio room, the gym, the full-time chefs, uh, full-time kit room, everything. So that was brilliant. The pitch was looking like a carpet. So for me to be there and, and really explore and see what they were doing now was fantastic. And like I said, the players now, I mean, back in my days, yeah, we, we, there was good players and we, we were trying to be the best we can. But now you look at these players, they're real athletes, real, real athletes. The way, they're, the way they sleep, the way they eat, the way they drink, and just the way they're full professionalism. I'm not saying that we weren't professional back in our day, but the way, like I said, because football was really involved, these guys were fantastic. The ball speed was unbelievable. The, the technical ability of these boys, so young and but so gifted. And it was a real pleasure to, to actually see it live on a training pitch. And uh, it was really good, really good to see. Yeah, you, you touched on the, on the players there and, and the professionalism. Um, I want to mention one specifically now. Um, as we mentioned, you scored 25 goals in your first season. Ollie Watkins just got his 26th. Yeah. In his first year, as the main number nine for the club. Just to tell us how special he is as a player. And can you see similarities with what you had in your game as well? Yeah, again, Oli's come back from a, a lower, lower level. Uh, and he's a, he's, a great, he's a great kid. I've luckily had the pleasure of meeting him a few times when I went back. And even funny you say that, even just to the, yesterday, I messaged him to say congratulations and uh, make sure you keep firing Brentford on. And for him to score them many goals. And if you think about it, he wasn't really a, a, a real out-and-out number nine. It was maybe a bit of a default that he ended up playing in that position. Because when he first came, he was more that winger sort of type. 
but he's he's got into that number nine position and he's really thrived on it and he's he's taken it he's taken it by the scruff of the neck and he, he's done so well. Some of his goals are some of the goals are magic. He's either scored outside the box, six yard tappings, which any goal scorer striker wants to do, and he's done that in abundance now. Like you say, twenty six goals, and hopefully he can get a couple more to push him to the promised land. Yeah, do you believe he, he truly is a Premier League player in waiting? Like you say, so much in his game and he works so hard as well, as of course. Yeah, easy. I personally know if you can score 25, 25 goals in, in a championship plus, uh, you're a good striker. <laughs> that's, no, that's no secret about that. You're a good striker. Will he be able to do it in the Premiership? Yes, I believe he will. One, because he's young, he's still hungry, just the way, and he's very humble. Uh, very, when, I, when, I met him a few, well, when I met him and even when I talked to him now, a very humble guy. Uh, who who wants to learn, and I guess he wants to do the best he can. And I believe, whether it will be with Brentford or elsewhere, he will he will be a successful player in the future for sure. Yeah, uh, one of uh, many you know special players in that Brentford team, of course. But how much would have you liked to have played in that so-called BMW that Brentford have got in uh, in Ben Rama and Buemo and Watkins? Yeah, mate. I mean, like I said, I mean they played a real attacking flair for you. back in my days. It was more of a four-four-two. So like me and my strike partner Ben Burgess with some guys behind us, some good wingers. But these these three, like I said, the way they them three played together, it's just it's beautiful. Cutting in from the right to the left, uh, like side Ben I mean, for me, he's a real talent. That's a that's a special player. To be fair, I didn't really notice him too much before when I was early on in the in the season, even last year. But I've been really really watching the last three or four months when they came back, obviously out of isolation. And he, he is special. He's a special player. Yeah, causing interest from the likes of Chelsea it shows you how special he is. Um, I want to talk about the manager though now, Thomas Frank as well. Uh, we've seen how he you know, comes across very confident in the media, but you, you've seen these players firsthand, as you said, uh, back in January in, in training. Just tell us how he gets the best out of these players though. Just, from, just by observing, this is honesty. From us, I saw his man management skill was beautiful. Uh, obviously, first and foremost, he welcomed me into the into the ground and training. And he's, I mean, the first thing he said to me goes, "Any any player who's played for Brentford is always welcomed here." So automatically, you feel part of it. And then when we went into the video analysis room, I see the, the way the boys came in. Myself, Kevin Connor, and a few of the guys were already in there. And then the players started coming. And just even their aura when when he when they walked into the room, the sort of appreciation and the camaraderie they showed towards each other, him and to the players was fantastic. And then when they got onto the training pitch. He has a nice aura about him. He's not one of them really loud, shouty, shouty managers, but he was nice and calm, collective, very cool. And uh, he just had a great feeling. He, I think he feels like they're, li- they're his little brothers, all the boys. And I think that's like, like their big brother. So it's that, they've got a nice combination there together. Nice synergy. Yeah, you yourself as well, you, you must have heard of the, the Brentford playoff curse that there has been. Uh, never won in, I think, eight campaigns. How are they going to change that this time? Is it going to be ninth time lucky, do you think? Mate, I hope I really hope not. I really hope not. Like I said, I, I was one of, I was part of that one of them eight in my time uh, when we lost to Stoke. And what and what was even worse is that we we beat Stoke like three weeks before the playoff final. I think it was three nil, three one at home, and then we go to Millennium Stadium and then we lose two nil. But I just hope this time round, whoever went for play, they're gonna uh, Get get there and 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 yeah, get to the get to that promised land. What what is it like? Just just explain the feeling of playing in a in a playoff final. Obviously, it's not a, a great experience for you losing it, but the, the pressure and the the occasion itself it, it is something, isn't it? Yeah, I guess in a way, I think it might be a bit of a blessing for the boys this time because they have no fans. Where obviously back in my day we had the fans, and obviously because of circumstances in the world now, uh, there's going to be no one there at Wembley, but. I believe with what they know they need to do, I honestly, I've got a real heart, good feeling that this year is going to be the one for us. Definitely going to be the one. So you think it's going to be the one? Are you going to have that opportunity to stay up and, and watch this one 4 a.m. start? No, this one, this one I'm going to, even though, I've, even though I've got work on, on the Wednesday morning early doors, uh, I'll be, I'll be set the alarm at that four o'clock and I'll, I will be up to watch that. I have to, I have to watch that. I have to watch it. Well, Lloyd, get some sleep before then. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you very much. Cheers. Now, as we mentioned, Ollie Watkins has been a man on fire so far this season for Brentford. But back in his early days at Exeter, he was struggling to make a mark in their League Two first team. Well, earlier this season, I talked to his former manager, Paul Tisdale, about how he finally managed to break through after a simple bit of advice. He happened to be there the whole time. My 
my period at Exeter. So he was 10 years old when I was first there and he did it all the way through and he knew about Ollie all the way through because he was very athletic. He could, he could, he had good feet, he could score a goal. And he's being coached, he's being coached in the system. And it's, for me, it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit uh, two dimensional, the, the system of coaching. Um, but he's one of the best players coming through and he's, he plays up front or he plays on the left wing. And he joins us as a young professional, so he's now 18. So he turns professional. Big potential. Everyone's spoken about him. And then he gets... He, he, hits, he hits a wall. The wall is professional football. The wall is match day. The wall is business. The wall is we've got to win this week. It's not about being coached to be a number 11. So, you know, Ollie spent 18 months, two years in the Exeter reserves. I think he went out on loan to Western Supermare for a year. Um, but he was a number 11 out on the left wing. And in his mind, he's thinking, well, the goalkeeper gets it and he rolls it out to the centre half. That's A. And the centre half, maybe back to the goalkeeper. That's B. And then B into the centre midfield player. That's C. Then C passes it to number 10. That's D. And then D plays it out to the left back. And then E plays it to Ollie. And I'm F. So in this pro, I'm A, B, C, D, A, and I'll wait out here and I'll be number F, or the letter F. And I'd say, that's effing useless, Lolly. Why can't you be A? When the goalkeeper gets it, why can't you be looking for the ball? Then when it goes to the centre half, why can't you be the next one? Why have you got to be just this one player in this process? You, why can't you be everything? Why can't you be, why can't you be engaged in whatever's happening? And I remember going up to Scotland um, with a pre-season tour, so Ollie would have been 19. And when it, we said at St Andrews in Scotland, and we had a pre-season tour, we played a couple of um, games up there, and Ollie didn't make the 24-man squad. So this is Ollie Watkins, who's now top scorer in the championship, 20 years old. He couldn't make our um, he couldn't make our pre-season tour, touring party to Scotland. And then we had a, I wanted to take two 11s with a couple of spares, and we had a left back that got injured. I said Ollie, you've got to come along as a left back. I can't play left back. Yes, you can. Just come along as a left back. You're not, otherwise, you're, just, you're staying here, training on your own. So Ollie came as a left back and uh, he played in a couple of the games. And I remember coming off one game in particular, being so upset. You know, where's his career going? He's 20 years old or 19. He's 20 years old. Um, I'm not a left back. What my, I, can't, he, he, I, I honestly think he couldn't remember how to control the ball. He was thinking so hard he couldn't control the ball. So we had a sit down, Ollie and I, um, and this probably sums up how I think coaching should be. We had a sit down a, a, a month or two later, and I said, Ollie, you're gonna have to start again. You know, you are physically excellent, technically brilliant. You can score a goal. Your attitude is wonderful. Your personality is to die for. There's not a lot that should go wrong here, other than you are overthinking this. So we are going to completely um, alter the way you think. So the biggest problem is you don't get the ball enough. You're waiting out on the wing as F. I'm, at it, I'm F. You're waiting for everybody else to get the ball to you. And what happens if the wind's blowing the other way and they can't kick it to the left and the wind takes it to the right? You're not going to get a touch. You've got to reposition yourself how you think. So the next reserve game we had, and it was Reading away, I said, um, we need to or you, you need to, in my opinion, try and have three headers per half, make three tackles, pick up three interceptions, and pick up three loose balls. Forget about anyone passing you the ball. So if you, can, if you can tick all those four boxes, that's 12 touches you get in the first half, and then we repeat it again in the second half. That's 24 moments, heading, tackling, interception, and picking up loose ball. I knew for a fact he wasn't capable of doing those things. But that wasn't the point. The point was changing how he thought. So it started with the kickoff. He was playing in the diamond, I think. And he said to Danny Butterfield, who was playing in the game, when the, for the kickoff, roll it back and then chip it to me on the left and I'll head it. And he was being a little bit, a bit contrary with me. I'll just head it and that'll be one ticked off. You know, but get to the point as a player where you actually, 
you can get a little bit shirty and he was being contrary and just wanted to get so he, he, the ball was chipped up and he headed it so straight away he's, he's ticked one of those boxes and then it so it went on then he got a tackle then he picked up a loose ball then he but it wasn't the fact that he was ticking those boxes to me it was the fact that he was then engaged with everything every time the goalkeeper got it he's thinking I might head this I'll call for it or if he kicks it somewhere else I'll be on the move because I might get it I might actually be on the piece. I might be on the move and get it. I'll get one of those picking up a loose ball. So it wasn't about what actually happened. Technically, it was about how he thought. And he played so well. And he got lots of passes. And he kept picking the ball up and turning. And I thought, I'll pick him in the first team on Saturday. It was away to Plymouth in the local derby down at Plymouth. And I played in the same position, which he hadn't played for me before that reserve game at Reading. I was playing down at Plymouth. And he got man of the match. We won... We went 2 0. Ryan Harley scored two goals with 2 1 or 2 0. 2 1, maybe. Ryan Harley scored two goals. And Ollie was brilliant. And that was it. And that was a moment. And then you just work off the back of that. All his training was there. His athleticism was there. The coaching was there. But it was then creating something where somebody could play with freedom, which then meant he had to be a centre forward. He couldn't be out on the, on the left wing. Um, now I see him playing centre forward again. I know why he's doing so well. He's in the game more. He's, he's engaged more rather than waiting on the wing. So it's trying to find something all the time which which engages a player and gets them back to playing on instinct and freedom, assuming they have had enough organisation and coaching within their structure that they, they know the positions. They know where they should be standing. They don't have to think about that all the time. So that's a great example of taking a player at 19, 20 that was literally overthinking everything and turning it around. Um, when I was 19, I wish I had me to tell me that. Well, I'm delighted to say we're now joined by a man who knows all about getting Fulham promoted to the Premier League. That man is former France international Louis Saha. Louis, thanks for joining us, first of all. How good is it for you to see Fulham within a game of the Premier League again? Yeah, it's exciting. I think uh, when you know the history of this club, uh, he, he went through a path where it was, it was tough, um, starting to build kind of another legacy and... Uh, I have some really dear memories about uh, going going back to the Prem, and um, it was smoother, I have to admit, uh, than what uh, you see in here. Then, so yes, obviously it's a, it's a very uh, it's a very strong and very hard journey. The championship, you know, it's like a lot of games. So I have to uh, acknowledge the the great work of uh, Scott Parker because he's really he's really tough. Um, but um, yeah, it's exciting because uh, it's a club who deserves totally to be in a prom. Um, there is like a lot of quality through the years. Yeah, like you said, a very tough league to get out of as well. I just want to talk to you about your time specifically at Fulham now. Can you remember, you know, when you joined the club? Can you believe it's 20 years as well since you signed for the club all that time ago back in 2000? Yeah, you were not obliged to. To acknowledge that uh, time, you know, 20 made me older. And <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, I do remember it was uh, obviously uh, a town that uh, I really liked. Um, but uh, at the moment of my career, I was really looking for the best platform to actually improve as a player. And I think when John Tigana just talked to me and explained the actual project, what uh, it meant to him to, to have um, that style of play um, that we we were totally uh, kind of like uh, uh, new in the, in, the, in the style. We play in the floor and, and it was quick football. So he, bring, uh, he brought some really technical players. Um, so all those things was um, ideal for me as a player and as a young boy. So I, I thought that uh, 20 years back when I started my career, it was a major, major um, move. Um, and everything went very natural with the fans, with the with the owner of the club, uh, everything was really, um, uh, really, I, I would say, like uh, ideal to to build your confidence. Um, we had some 
great games, great, uh, I would say, run of play um, where we won and bounced. Uh, you know, like really good performances, uh, good banter as well. I was like talking with uh, Chris Coleman the other day. Um, uh, all those things uh, were the best moment of his whole career. Six months uh, because he had a horrific injury. So it means a lot um, to everybody who has um, yeah, lived uh, through that moment. Can you remember your debut as well all those years ago against Crew Alexandra, I believe it was? And, and you scored a goal on your debut as well. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a very important moment. Um, when you start your season and you see you start with a goal, you have a few games to adapt uh, during preseason. Uh, let's say it was um, good in terms of feelings, but I was not scoring, so it was good to to be uh, at the end of this uh, ball. From if I'm not uh, uh, yes, remember badly. Uh, I think it was a John Conin pass, if I'm not wrong. So I did manage to 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 score that goal, and, and I think it was a perfect platform again to to get more um, and manage to to get promoted. So it was it was perfect. Yeah, as you, as you say, got that promotion. So many goals and so much success for you in that first season, personally and for the club. Is that one of the best years of, of your career? Did you look back at that as being one of the fondest memories that year of promotion? Yes, of course. When you're young, when you you want to be a professional, when you, you want to, to have fun, when you want to actually um, get that sensation of like, you know, like learning your job the best way possible, uh, having like a philosophy that uh, is completely in line with what you you dream uh, as a kid. All those things were were perfect. And Fulham, as I said, uh, is a very uh, competitive club, but it's very family approach. So all those things were just perfect. You see smile on the face of every staff. You see the actual dedication of like every staff wanting to promote and, and, and get better. You, you understand that you are in the right place when you're 20 and 21. So all those things were, as I said, uh, uh, perfect uh, for me. Um, and as I said, uh, I think we grew as, as, as players, but even the kind of like players who were older managed to, to, to get the best uh, out of it. So I really felt privileged uh, in that time where you always like uh, look at uh, those moments in, in a career. Obviously, I had a chance to 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 do um, some move where I, I moved from different clubs and managed to play internationally. So all those moments where, uh, as I said, it's a foundation to to leave uh, great things. And how much did it mean to you at the time to to get your chance of playing in the Premier League and and being, you know, the number one striker for a team in the Premier League? Obviously, it gives you the platform to go on and play for the likes of you know Manchester United and and later Everton. Yeah, as, as I said, you know, the actual luck that you have when you're young, you know, you don't think about the aspect of everything, you know, you just like smoothly do things and uh, you're very innocent, you know, and, you know, it's like, it's very important to stay, to stay a kid, you know, and, and those approach are, are more difficult right now with social media, the actual number of games on TV and all that, so... I was like 20 years back, there is no social media of stuff. So everything was natural and you, you feel like you have the right platform, you know, you can go home without like kind of like attention on you all the time. So getting the prim, uh, Premier League was as well, I felt like it was totally deserved. We had the level to go there and enjoy, we had good players. When you joined by uh, Van der Sar, you know, like, you know, like, a big star in an international stage, you understand that you will have uh, the right equipment, the right tools, the right, I would say, philosophy to be in the Prem for, for long. And that's what we managed to to really um, done and, and, and try to create some kind of like, I would say, um, I would say a legacy in some way. So that was very important because I said, as a sportsman, you always like, feel like you always have a step and, and the next step and the next step so you don't just like enjoy the Prem, you know, you know, you want more, you want more goals, you want international goals, you want to uh, uh, win trophies or be part of a good winning cups. All those things were part of what it is uh, um, to be a professional in Fulham in any club. 
And finally, how much would it mean to you to, I sort of touched on it, but how much would it mean to you to see Fulham back in the Premier League again? And can they do it against Brentford? Do you believe that they will win? I think so. I think they definitely have the, you know, the, 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 the Prem quality, the focus. Uh, Scott Parker has done a tremendous job to, you know, give that mentality, that consistency. Uh, it was not the actual strength last year. I think they've done way better. They, they, they managed to have like the big run of, of wins and strong performances. So young players has like really uh, performed really, really well. And, and that's why I think it's exciting to see them back because I'm sure that uh, they have learned from the mistake from the past. And when they're going to come back, they have seen how to, to actually uh, get the exciting, um, uh, I would say, identity of Fulham. That's like really traditional way of Fulham as well, and gets that consistency back in the prem as well. So I'm very excited as a as a fan uh, to see uh, the, the the that identity, that unique identity of Fulham be back in the prem. Because as I said, this is a special club, and I'm very excited. So it will mean a lot. Um, obviously, I didn't follow as much. Uh, I have to be honest, but uh, obviously, I've got like a lot of uh, staff people are still there like uh, monuments down here and I always wish them the, the, the best and I uh, always think that uh, uh, London is a special place for football. Louis, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Take care. So our number one, the number one EFL expert, Joby McEnough, now joins us. So you've watched all these playoff games, Joby. Have we got the right final in the end, do you think? I believe so. I think over the course of the season, um, certainly for me, Fulham and Brentford um, have been the two standout teams in terms of the, the ones that did make it into the playoffs. Of course, Swansea and Cardiff did fantastically well, both coming with late runs to get themselves in those positions. But you only have to look at the, the points difference, one from those two, Fulham and uh, Brentford down, but also how close they were to the top two for me to justify certainly them being in the final, you know, but that being said, they still have to get over two tricky legs against, again, what we saw as two very, very good teams. Um, so they fully, fully deserve to be in that final, not just for the season that they've had, but also, you know, getting over those um, playoff games as well. Yeah, before we get more on to both those teams. I just want to touch on, as you mentioned, Swansea and Cardiff, though. Played their part in two terrific ties. And both, as you mentioned, have had good seasons, especially under the circumstances of first as well. Yeah, for sure. Again, you know, I think both clubs, managers, sets of players um, and fans can be incredibly pl- proud of, of their football clubs, you know, and what they've done. Again, Neil Harris going in with Cardiff miles, miles away. I think, although he was confident, I, I don't think there'll be many others around outside of Cardiff that really felt they were going to get themselves in that playoff mix. And, and they did. Um, again, Swansea, having had a good start, um, fell off a little bit. And then really came strong. A couple of real key signings, Rian Brewster, Conor Gallagher in January, um, really just gave them a bit of fresh impetus moving forward. And um, again, for them, I think there's bright futures there. Swansea going through a, a restructuring phase. They've, they've had to sell good players. Um, loans look like a good avenue for them to get good quality players in. Cardiff, it was just about getting more out of that group of players. And Neil Harris has certainly done that. And they're going to be a tough, tough team to beat next year. So, you know, massive credit to to both those football clubs. Fantastic games, I've got to say, in the circumstances, with no fans there, we have spoken about it, can affect the tempo and the intensity of those matches. But we saw both legs, four clubs going at it, as they should do, with so much at stake. And, you know, they gave us um, some fantastic performances. Yeah, you feel like both those teams will be contenders maybe next season for promotion. But back to Brentford and Fulham. I, I feel like I've talked to you so much about both these teams already this season. But for those who haven't had a chance to listen to, to your views on them, can you just go through what makes them both the, the teams that they are? What makes them special? Well, funnily enough, that for me, having seen a lot of both of them, there are a lot of similarities between these two teams. Uh, You'd have to say with their, their points tallies, they've been pretty much inseparable for, throughout the season where they've ended up. Um, the games, again, Brentford have, have got the edge, but I know for a fact that the first one after restart, Fulham were very disappointed to, to lose that game. So 
very, very free flowing teams like to play out from the back, play through the lines and get good control and, and have good possession. You know, and again, you look at the top four teams, certainly all teams that want to keep the ball and real emphasis on possession based football. They obviously, again, for me, their strengths are those attacking areas. So we talk about BMW a lot, um, Ben Rama and Buemo, Oli Watkins for Brentford who have been incredible, you know, big, big numbers from all of those with goals and assists this season. And then obviously Fulham, really in an attacking sense, Mitrovic has, has had to carry the burden, certainly in terms of goal scorers. Um, and I think if Brentford really, really get to the final with those three in top, top form as they were for the second leg, that could be the difference because there's really not a lot between the teams. And I think it is generally going to be down to which big players turn up on the day that are going to prove to be the difference. I'll get more on to, to Mitrovic later on, but I think one player in particular that we haven't really spoken about, though, is Neskins Cabano, who seems to have come from nowhere in recent weeks. Yeah, he's had to be very, very patient. Again, you look at that Fulham forward line um, and the wide players themselves, you know, they've got a lot of options, a lot of firepower there. Again, you've got the likes of Cavalero there, Bobby Reed, Anthony Knocker, and Cabano has had to play second fiddle for, for large parts of the season. But again, from a coach or manager's point of view, you want your players to be ready. You know, he's, he's shown great patience. But then when they are given an opportunity, those lads that haven't been playing regularly, you really want them to go and make a statement and say Gaffar should be in the team. But they can only do that with their performances. And in an attacking sense with Cabano, again, his goals have been vital for Fulham recently. And, you know, he's playing at the top, top of his game. So coming off, I'm hoping it was just precautionary because, again, he's been a real big source of goals for them. I think it's four in four, three free kicks in a row. Um, you know, prior to, to last night. So they want to make sure that he's out on the pitch come Tuesday, that's for sure. Yeah, been on fire in recent weeks. I can name two more players as well who we haven't really touched on before. The, the goalkeepers. Um, how crucial have both Raya and Rodak been for these signs? I know you were quick to praise Raya's distribution, especially um, in the match against Swansea. Yeah, again, it's a big, big part of football now. You know, again, days gone by, you'd want your keeper to be able to catch it and keep it out the net and that was about it but now with the way it's going and the way these teams are certainly playing it starts from that goalkeeper so they have to be comfortable in terms of their just distribution and again the pace both teams have got but particularly Brentford that we saw with that counter-attacking goal um, in the second leg very very commanding from David Rea came out claimed the ball real quick release to set them on their way um, and again, he's made some big saves at important times and uh, Rodak also has, has had to do the same. So two top keepers for me, you know, and um, yeah, we talk a lot about the attackers, which we should do because they are fantastic. But Brentford in particular of recent times have had a fantastic defensive record and, and David Ray has been a very, very big part of that. Yeah, top um he won the Golden Glove, sorry, did uh, David Ray. So, yeah, top goalkeeper in the division. But Brentford have also beaten Fulham twice already this season. We heard uh, Brentford captain Pontus Janssen talk about that and how it may help them before Fulham even reached the final. Um, who, who do you see that benefiting more um, talk like that? Could be, could be adding motivation for those Fulham players. Yeah, definitely. And I've been spoke to, to Michael Hector after last night. Um, I actually said to him, you know, in terms of the losing a couple of games against them, how did he? And he said, the first thing he said was, no, we actually, we lost, but we, we got a lot of confidence from that game. We didn't feel we should have lost. And this is the second one. Obviously, the first one was a lot, lot earlier in the season. I don't think you can take too much of it. So much has happened since then. Um, but certainly the one after lockdown, you know, he probably felt they were maybe a little bit too adventurous in terms of trying to get that win at that time, whereas maybe a point would have served them better. But again, that enthusiasm of, of, after the restart and everyone getting going could have been a difference. It's a completely different game now. And, you know, Scott, I'm sure will be looking at that things that perhaps they didn't do as well as he would have liked, but there were things in there that he was really happy with. And again, it was, it was two late goals, obviously from Brentford's point of view, they, they got one and they got another one on the counter when, when Fulham were trying to get back in the game. So there will be loads there. Fulham will certainly take motivation from it. You know, anytime a team beats you, 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 you have that, bit between your teeth you know you, you've got one over and you're ready and you don't want to happen again 
Brentford, I think, will take confidence, but have to be careful that doesn't spill into overconfidence and assuming that they've got Fulham's number because, um, you know, it's a one-off game. I can't stress that enough. Almost everything beforehand goes out the window when it comes to a playoff final. And it really is about those players delivering a performance as close to their best as they can and as many players as they can. And, and they're generally the teams that, that get over the line. You might say this is a stupid question, uh, but let's talk about Mitrovic, a, a player who's obviously had a terrific season, as you've mentioned. But weirdly enough, Fulham have actually haven't really missed him. Um, and when you look at the statistics, and have, they've actually done better when he's not been available. He missed both games so far in the playoffs and played in both games against Brentford, and obviously Fulham lost those games. Based on that, should he actually even start if he's fit, or should he be um, used off the bench, maybe? Listen, uh, a fully fit or near fully fit uh, Mitrovic starts for Fulham. There's there's no two ways about it. I, I get the point. They actually have got a very good record without him. And that is something I would want to dig a little bit deeper into. Certainly if I was Scott Park, I'm sure he's looked at potentially why that might be the case. The, the most obvious one for me is he's a big character. He's a big presence, you know, in that team, in that dressing room. And sometimes on the pitch, players can almost leave it up to him to go and do the business because they know nine times out of 10, he will. Whereas when he's not on the pitch, maybe those players around him as a collective come together a little bit more and, and take a little bit more responsibility, knowing they haven't got their 26 goal season striker, just going to stick a chance away. So um, look, it speaks volumes about the strength and depth for Fulham that they can be without the league's top scorer and still have a better record than when they've got him in the team. So I think that would be the most pleasing aspect for Scotty the last however many games they've had to do without him. That Again, they would love him to be out there, but if he wasn't, I don't think it's the end of the world. And um, I, I think he'd fancy his chances without him as much, or maybe a little bit less than, than with him, I think. Yeah, like I said, you could call that a stupid question, but it's worth pointing out that the fact that they have done better without Mitrovic, which is obviously massively surprising. Um, but on the flip side, Ollie Watkins seems to be crucial to the way that, that Brentford play and had a terrific game in that second leg. How important will he be in, in this match and how, how much are you looking forward to his battle with, with Michael Hector as well? Yeah, I've got to be honest, I've been so, so impressed with, with Ollie Watkins. And for anyone who's been lucky enough to see him, play uh, earlier in the season certainly obviously not so much recently but live you know it's his movement it's his work off the ball and again he's one that so many people talk about the goals he scores and the fact he's gone from a winger into a striker and his numbers are fantastic but from a playing point of view playing with a striker that works as hard as that does you know surely from an opposition point of view doesn't give those defenders a second to rest he made a 40 50 yard recovery run the other night back into pretty much you know, deep into his own half to to recover the ball. And then a minute later, he was making a, another lung-bursting run, the other end of the pitch. And again, that gives you opportunities in itself, that work rate, that willingness to to run beyond people. And again, once he gets in this area, as he showed the other night, he's very, very clinical. So, you know, again, someone I've been hugely, hugely impressed with his progress. Looking forward to that battle. Again, Michael Hector, I know well having played with him myself. And he's been a big part of Fulham in the second half of the season, being harder to beat, not conceding as many cheap goals that they were doing in the first half of the season. So I think that, as you say, is going to be a real key, key battle in who comes out on top. You know, it'd be a tough game for, for Michael Hector against a very informed striker, but one that I'm sure he's reddishing. You know, as you do, you want to play against the best players and, you know, Ollie Watkins is certainly that when it comes to sent forwards in this division. Yeah, the best against the best is, is the phrase that he may be using in that situation. But I, I know you tipped Fulham as well to be the side who, who would go up before the playoffs started. Um, but after what Brentford did in those semi-finals, in that second leg in particular, are you hedging your bets a bit now? Um, I think certainly on the second leg display, Brentford were... Very, very impressive. I was a little bit worried for them in that their form, obviously the last two games where they didn't get anything, they just needed a win or two draws would have got them up. The first leg, um, they were okay without being spectacular. Clearly the, the red card had a big bearing on, on the outcome of the game. I didn't think they did enough to really convince me in that 
game that they were going to be a, a big, big threat. Now off the back of the second leg where they looked like the Brentford we had seen when they won eight games on the bounce. And they're going to be a match for anybody. Um, Fulham kind of did it in reverse. Very impressed with them in the first leg. Very, very impressed. They never let Cardiff get into their strides. You know, they kept the ball so, so well. And they weren't quite able to do that. But it's very easy to get wrapped up in that with Cardiff. They're very good at what they do. Give them their credit. Again, the you could feel the anxiety, the, the, the tenseness around the stadium. And I think that affected them slightly. The fact it's going to be an all-out football match, you know, two very, very good football teams. Um, I really, honestly, I'm not just sitting on the fence here, but it's such a hard one to call. Um, you know, you are talking probably the flip of a coin, maybe a decision here or there, or a moment of magic that is going to make the difference. They are two fantastic football teams. And I hope that it's the best team that wins. You know, I really hope it's, uh, again, a piece of brilliance or one team really coming out on top of the other to to decide who goes up because they've both had brilliant, brilliant seasons. Yeah, it should be some spectacle. But, I mean, I, I know you, you sort of answered this in terms of everything goes out the window going into a playoff final. But, well, Brentford's end of season, you know, that mini capitulation they had, I know they obviously had that fantastic run. Um, but that end of season capitulation, you know, those two games in a row they had to, to, a chance to, to win that automatic promotion. Will that still be in their minds, do you think, at, at all? Because obviously it was effectively a playoff final for, for them in, in both those games, well, in that game particularly against Barnsley, was a, was like a playoff final for them. Yeah, I'll be honest, that's what I was really intrigued with. And, and luckily, you know, having, having covered the game, that's what I wanted to ask Ollie Watkins. How did they deal with it? How were they feeling? And, um, you know, his answer and their performance convinced me that they were over that. I think if they'd have just limped over the line or they hadn't played particularly well in the second leg, I would have been a little bit more concerned, but that was a team that had certainly put those last three games to bed for me and what well, two definitely and a little bit of the first leg, um, you know, to bed. They looked like they're back to, to what they are, what they're about. Again, their movement, their link-up play, the front feet all involved, goals and assists. And I can't see that being an issue for the final. You know, I, th I think that was a massive shot in the arm for them. Again, not just the fact that they won, but the performance and getting back to what they do to really bring that confidence back before the final comes. Yeah, you mentioned that you, you talked to Ollie Watkins. You, you spoke to both managers uh, as well, um, I noticed. Uh, can, um, I noticed. Uh, can I just ask you what you make of, of their approaches in terms of uh, man management and speaking to the media? They, they seem to be completely at the opposite ends of the scale, don't they, in terms of their approach? Yeah, I'll be honest. I mean, I think particularly after the first leg, with, with everything that went on with, with Brentford and the sending off that I think we all felt was, was very harsh. You know, I think Thomas Frank was a, a little bit prickly. It seemed as though the pressure was building and, and had gotten to him a little bit. Um, so, again, I think the post-match there, it, it was just a result of, of all the emotions that were going on for him. He was a lot more calm and relaxed and how he normally is after the second leg. Of course, they won, um, but still very open, you know, both very um, generous with the time, you know, willing to answer the questions. And, and I suppose Scott goes into to great detail when he speaks and, um, you know, certainly from from our point of view, being able to speak to them and pick their brain and, and try and get a little bit of insight is, is fantastic for us. And it hopefully gives the fans, um, you know, a, a bit of a, a inside track in terms of what's going on in their minds. But um, in general, both of them are, are very open and, um, again, very receptive to, to those questions. I think it, it's worth pointing, just for me noticing in terms of their, their approach after the game, it seems to be... Um, Thomas Frank is more. He believe he's got a lot of belief in his players, and he's quite forthright in in saying that. And and Scott Parker is a bit more humble in in terms of his approach. Is that what the impression that you get between the two of them? Yeah. Listen again. I don't think there's a wrong or a right a right way. They've both been hugely successful this season in terms of getting the teams where they are now. I think the belief that. Thomas Frank has in his team has, has come from being around that group of players consistently knowing exactly their strengths, their weaknesses. And he feels genuinely if they perform to anywhere near their levels, they will beat any team pretty much. And it's great for a player to, to know your manager's got that confidence in you. Um, I think Scott 
also has a great belief in that team, undoubtedly. You know, he, he, he knows what he's got there. I think his slight issue would maybe come with the fact that they had conceded some real sloppy goals earlier on in the season. And again, that was something I was quite keen to, to ask him in terms of if he felt his team had addressed that. And also that you can't just be a good footballing team and that's it. You do need to be able to get through results when you're not playing particularly well. You need players to make decisions that although you're a passing team, it, there just might be times where it's just not on and you have to just play a bit of a longer pass or sometimes just, just kick the ball out. If it's safe, you concede in a goal. You know, he doesn't want to just play for the sake of playing. You know, he wants to play to be effective and he doesn't want it to cost sloppy goals. So um, I think he, he certainly has a, a belief. I think maybe it's a, a slightly more low-key approach, certainly from, from Scott. But I know for a fact, having spoken to him, you know, that he, he's had a real strong belief in that group of players and, and feels they're good enough to, to beat Brentford and, and get to the Premier League. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see which approach works in that final. But finally, I know it's not related to the game, which is you know what the podcast is all about, but I can't not ask you, is Yaya Torre taking the captain's armband from you next season? <laughs> I said he was allowed to come in as long as I kept the captaincy. Um, and to be fair, I'll be honest, I, he's not one of those characters that, that would come in and demand it anyway. Um, <laughs> he's been a real joy to be around, I've got to be honest. It was... Um, bit of a, a one out of the blue, I think certainly Ross and, and Martin Ling will, will say it was a, a bit of a random um, initial bit of contact. I think that they weren't quite sure whether it was actually Yaya Torre or maybe someone else called Torre that was, was trying a fast one to get in for pre-season. But turned out it was the man himself and he's been a, a real breath of, breath of fresh air around the place. Someone who's achieved as much as he has, you know, to come in, he needs to get fit. You know, I think he's got a few things happening behind the scenes that he's, he's waiting on. Um, he lives in London currently, so he, he saw it as an opportunity to come in and get fit. And he's really embraced, you know, everybody, all the, the coaching. He, he's stepping into our sessions and he's bringing, you know, little bits of wisdom with him. You know, we'll sit down, we'll, we'll pick his brain, you know, about Messi, about Pep Guardiola, you know, Man City. It's amazing to get... You know, I've been fortunate enough to, to get a little glimpse of that level. You know, he's lived it for his whole career and there's some players that have been nowhere near it. So for us, you know, to be able to just feed into that has been brilliant. And again, I can't speak highly enough of, of the man himself. You know, just a real pleasure to be around. Um, brilliant for the club in terms of the, the exposure that that's getting as well. And, you know, I think it ticks a lot of boxes. Certainly, Yaya's happy. He just wants to come in. He says, I just want to feel the pitch, I want to feel the grass, feel the ball, have a touch of the ball. You know, I don't want to just run at home or be on a bike somewhere. He loves football. And again, for the lads, the younger ones in particular, to see a 37-year-old who's achieved what he's done, to just come in and say, I just love being here. I love playing football. It's brilliant because that's what it's really about, Ben. And it's, um, you know, for me, it's, what, it's certainly what keeps me going at, at 38, that genuine love for, for the game. And, um, you know, again, I don't know how long he's going to be here, but, as long as he is, he's, he's very much welcome and, and we're all getting something from it. And is he going to be playing alongside Joby McEnough next season? Is he, is he going to be inside you? I don't think so. I've got to be honest. Uh, by all accounts, he, he's, uh, he's just passing through. Um, listen, I'm sure we'd do everything in our powers to, to try and make that happen. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be down to, to the big man. And listen, however long he wants to stay, he, as I said, he's, he's certainly welcome here. And, um, you know, we, we'll see what happens, but I can't imagine him ending up here. But listen, never say never. It's a funny old game. Um, we never know. Two weeks down the line, he, he might be going into play for us, so you never know. Yeah, Yaya Torre in League Two will be quite a sight, wouldn't it? But uh, Joby, it's, it's been a fantastic season to, to cover the AFL in, in terms of you know previewing the game. So thanks very much for all your contributions. And, well, yeah, all that's left to say is enjoy the final. Will do. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Well, that's it from us. Another unforgettable EFL season is about to come to a close. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the show if you've enjoyed what you've heard. Bye for now. Bye.